right, okay, so this is another PS4, obviously. And this one has a White Light of Death, apparently. That has got, judging by the shape of the pins, that's got the original HDMI port, the one where the pins push through the back. And I can see... Let me see if I can show you this under the scope. I can see a bit of a rough looking pin, so this might need a port as well. So what I mean by the shape of pins is on the original ports, the pins stick out a little bit from the edge of the plastic. So you can see like a lip, whereas they're sitting a little bit more flush on the on the other port, on the uh, the, the replacement ports that we use. So that side looks all good. I did see a glimmer of something on the other side of the port. So let me just flip that round. Uh, no, that's actually fine. And although it does look as though it's a little bit out of alignment. Yeah, that's moving around in there. The pins themselves look fine, but the port looks like it's a bit out of alignment. So, HDMI cable in. No signal. No signal. So I'll give it 10 seconds or so just to see if it shows up. But... At the minute, he's got no signal. And uh, we do have a white light. And um, that's had more than 30 seconds to display, and it's not showing up, so definitely no display. Oh, okay, so that's got a one terabyte. So the hard drive's been changed. Whenever I'm dealing with an no old display issue, the first thing I do is check the hard drive because hard drive can cause an no old display. It can also cause blue light of death. So I always check the hard drive first. So I've got a SATA breakout cable here. And I'm going to plug that into my computer. There we go. We have a bad hard drive. But is that the is that the cause of no display? How can a faulty hard drive cause no display? Because it's got the firmware on it, mate. So if it can't load the firmware, then it won't uh, it won't be able to um, load up the PlayStation logo sometimes. Right, so the hard drive is faulty on this, but is it the cause of no display? This is coming out of a Apple. So let's pop another hard drive in. And this has got an important note on it as well. And that is do not update. So this is going to be an early firmware. Yeah, it looks like it's out of an Apple computer, mate. Yeah. So someone's put a used hard drive in. Whether or not they've put it in as a test is another question. So if this was a bad hard drive, I would need to confirm whether or not it needs to be changed, which would need to wait till Monday. Bend that back down so as that goes over properly. So let's just pop it back together. Well, let's just turn it on and let's just see if that's the cause of no display. Even if it displays in safe mode, it might not display in 1080p. So this is just part of my diagnostic process. I'll just turn the TV back on. Drink some coffee. Oh, 
I'm going to give this a minute because it will need to boot into safe mode. But the hard drive being bad will need to be noted. Uh, I can't. I can't. If if the hard drive's not the cause of no display, I can't change the hard drive without permission. So I will need to get permission for the hard drive if it's not the hard drive causing no display. It looks like it isn't the hard drive. So even though the hard drive is bad, it looks like it's something else which has caused it. That's had well more than a minute to turn on and display. Right, okay, so that's not the primary cause of no display. So we've got a board issue. So yeah, the hard drive can cause no display because the firmware is on there. And if it can't load the firmware, if it's hanging... If it's hanging trying to load the load and initialize the firmware, then it's not going to display the PlayStation logo. Uh, or it does sometimes, but a lot of the time it doesn't. So I would imagine that if the customer is going to get the HDMI done, then at some point they're probably going to get the hard drive done because this is, as far as I'm aware, according to the ticket, a low firmware. So the ticket basically says do not update. Let me just cover that. So there's the ticket that it comes with. This comes from Console Repair London. And it's got a big do not update sign in, in a circle there. So obviously this is going to be on a low firmware. Which means that it's going to be worth more to the customer. To actually get it fixed. Even if it's going to work out not cost effective. I'm assuming, assuming it's a customer that changed this. And they're going to be aware of how to change it. So they'll probably deal with that themselves. And save themselves some money. I would assume. So the first thing I want to look at is this HDMI port. And actually that seems fine. So it was probably just a little bit of board flex what was causing that. With the, uh, the HDMI port moving. These boards are not very strong. Let's go under the scope and I'll start the diagnostics. Okay, so if we take a look at the port. The one big issue with these ports is that the pins on the back are exposed, so what happens a lot of the time with these is these pins will actually pull out. Uh, and they're a bit of a pain in the backside, to be honest, because they can end up shorting out and blowing the encoder anyway. So they can be a bit of a nightmare, but if it's not broke, don't fix it. And it looks like that port is good. I will give the pins a nudge test just to make sure they haven't come loose. So the nudge test is basically where I'll just go across the pins with a pair of tweezers and just make sure that all of the pins are good and that they're all solid. Okay, that's good. So I've got a set diagnostic process with the PS4 when we've got display issues. So when we've got no display at all, what I'll do, first of all, I'll go into continuity mode. And um, we've got a fuse just down here. This fuse is connected to pin 18, which is the 5 volt line. And this needs to have continuity from top to bottom. And it does. That generally gets blown when you get a surge down the HDMI port, usually when we've got thunder and lightning. The best thing I can suggest there is when you've got thunder and lightning outside, just unplug your console. In fact, unplug anything that's got a signal going through your TV. Because... Chances are you're gonna, your TV is going to take a hit and it's going to pass straight through to here. And um, This fuse here always blows when it does, which is a bit of a pain in the arse. Moving on, we've got a diode here on pin 18. So this here, this diode here is connected directly to the fuse. So just down here, whoops. Same as the cap as well. The cap and diode are all connected to this fuse. And then it's also connected to pin 18, just there. And uh, that's the 5 volt line, that's why it's got a nice thick trace. So it goes from pin 18 through these wires, it ends up here, and then it goes down to the fuse from there. Next thing I check, in diode mode, so I pop red probe on ground and I check pin number 15. So bin number 15 is this top DJ diode here. So red probe on green, black probe on 
here. Whoops, that's not in diode mode, it's in continuity. So, diode mode there, check that, and we get 0.5 volts, which is normal. Check these here, and we get, sorry, it's this side. Uh, Point five oh two. These two look like they're connected, but they're not. Point five oh one. Normal. This diode here. Point five. Yep, that's normal. This diode here. Point five is normal. This component here. I think this is a resistor. Normal. And then this diode here, this is linked to pin 13. Normal. Okay, so all of those are normal. So the next step I would do is to get a diode reading on the EMI filters. So, if I zoom in, pop red probe on ground again. And in diode mode, you can see that we've got some pins here with traces going down to some wires. So all of these patterns here are going down to data lines on the EMI filters. And I'll just check these in diode mode just to see what they read. 0.45 normal. All of these should be roughly the same. 0.45 normal. This is going to tell me if there's a blown filter. 0.45 normal. Uh, this one's acting a little bit strange. Okay, it's just a connection issue, 0.45, so that's normal. 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 0 0.434, a little bit lower, but still within range. 0 0.433, okay. Uh, right, so all of these EMI filters are giving me a reading in diode mode. Let's just see if we've got... Ah, okay, I'm getting 0 0.067 volts in diode mode on these two pins. So remember I said these two pins were a little bit low? Well, 0 0.06 volts to ground on, uh, uh, sorry, a 0 0.06 volt drop across the line on these two pins it means that this EMI filter is technically short. But it's not short, short. So that is 120 ohms. That's got a reading of 120 ohms across that line. And that's not normal. However, I don't think it's going to be the EMI filter. So what we should get is the same as what we're getting on this line, which is open line. So basically, the way these filters work is it's basically a wire. And there's two filters on each component. So there's one filter here. And there's one filter here. On the other side of the board this is. I'll show you that in a minute. But that should not be. That should not get cross talk. So you shouldn't have any kind of continuity at all. Or any kind of uh, low resistance reading on the filter. So you've basically got a filter there. Ground and then a filter. And ground is separating the pins. You shouldn't have a low reading there. But that's not telling me that the filter is bad. That's telling me that the encoder is bad. Because the filter is not blown. And there's no reason for it to blow. Because it hasn't been messed with. So that's a really low reading. This one here is coming up as open line. Which is normal. So it's not a dead short. But it is short. But that's going to be an internal short in the chip. That one's coming up as open line. And that one's coming up as open line. So the other three are normal. So these three groups here are normal. But this one's not. Yeah, so let's flip the board around. And underneath this shield here, just at the top here, we've got the EMI filters. And then this square here is where the chip is. So what I need to do is I need to take this shield off. It is soldered, so you need to be careful here. So I'm going to set the hot air to 460 degrees Celsius. 
40% airflow and I'm just going to heat up this corner but while I'm heating up the corner I'm going to put some upward pressure on it so I'm going to basically put the tweezers underneath the shield and I'm going to lift up so there's a slight bit of pressure on it not much, just a little bit and when it's ready it'll just pop itself off and you'll feel it give you'll see it give with the tweezers as well I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it do you see that little give? So that side there is loose now. So I'm going to move on to this side here. So there's another one just here. And do the same there. Pop. It doesn't need much pressure. If you put too much pressure on it, you're going to rip the trace. Now I'm going to move on to this corner. Pop. And now I'm going to grab it from this corner and I'm going to lift it up. And there's another one in this corner here. That's just popped. And then this side here. And eventually it'll come off without damaging the board. Right, so those EMI filters I was talking about are just here. So these four components you can see at the top. These are basically to filter out electromagnetic interference. And um, basically that just means that it's filtering out noise on the data lines to make sure that there's no interference because you don't want data you don't want electrical interference on a data line. Even minuscule amounts can cause glitching and stuff like that. But if we go into continuity mode, what we should have, we should have continuity from the top to the bottom, but you shouldn't have continuity from left to right. So these are what I'm gonna imagine are gonna be good. And these are going to have continuity as well, but we've got cross-torque on one of these. I think, I believe it's this one we've got cross-torque on. So we've got continuity there. We haven't got continuity there. However, we have got a resistance of 130 ohms from left to right. So that filter is definitely, definitely reading incorrect so you can see we've got continuity and we haven't got continuity that side but like i said we do have a resistance reading there that should be open line and it's not that's reading as 120 124 ohms and it's dropping and bear in mind the board is still warm resistance increases when the board is warm so that's a much lower reading than, than it's actually showing at the minute again there is good and we've got open line on that one we've got open line on that one and the filter is good and that one open line and the filter is good okay so the filters are testing fine apart from this one so even though we've got, like I said, even though we've got continuity from top to bottom um, and we've got no continuity technically from left to right, we have we have got some sort of an issue there because it is reading a resistance and it shouldn't. Uh, I haven't got the USB hooked up for the meter, mate. Um, actually, I can get it hooked up. Hang on. Right. So the multimeter is on the screen. And... If we if we take a look at these filters, so you'll see we've got a read in here and a very low resistance, which is normal. Same with that one, very low resistance, normal. But if you look from top from left to right. We've got 120 some odd ohms and dropping from left to right. So it doesn't matter whether you go top to bottom because we've got continuity from the top to bottom, top to the bottom, and the filter's working. It doesn't matter whether you go uh, one probe on the bottom and one probe on the top, or whether you go both probes on the bottom or both pro probes on the top. Ideally, you want to check both probes on the bottom just in case the filter's not working. But basically, if you look there, we've got a resistance there, and it should be open line. So like this one here, 
for example, we've got open line on that uh, filter there. From left to right, we've got open line. That is normal. That one isn't. So either that's going to be an issue with the filter or it's going to be an issue with the chip. I'm going to guess and say it's an issue with the chip. However, it's a lot cheaper, a lot easier and a lot safer to remove the filter. I don't like applying heat to the directly to the chip if I don't have to. So I'm going to remove the filter. And I'll end up replacing that filter no matter what because I don't really like to replace them with the same filter. I like to change them if I, if I take them off for any reason. Because these do die with heat. So I'm just going to knock this filter off and then I'm going to check the bottom pins and see what the resistance reading is once I've removed the filter. And that's going to tell me whether it's the filter or the chip. So the RC blows, and I've already checked the, um, the HDMI ports, and that appears fine. So, yeah, we've got open line there. And as you can see, we've still got a resistance there. So the issue wasn't with the filter, it was with the chip. But, like I said, I don't like exposing them chips to too much heat if I don't have to. So... I always remove the filter first. Even though I know in my head it's going to be the chip, I always remove the filter first. So I'm going to remove this chip. First I'm going to add a little bit of leaded solder just to make it a little bit easier. But this chip is definitely bad and that is probably going to be the cause of the no display. Well, not probably, it is going to be the cause. So this is the MN86471A and these are fairly expensive chips. So this is pretty much, well apart from it being a bad CP, a bad APU, which is not, it's not going to be, this is pretty much worst case scenario. So I'll just add some leaded solder and that just makes my life a little bit easier. I'm going to read in these pads as well while I'm here. So I'm going to need to put a new filter on there. So you don't have to add leaded solder, but I like to. To make my life easier. Alright, so now I'm going to use hot air to remove it. Yeah, so these chips are fairly expensive. If you buy these from places like eBay, expect to pay 30 pound minimum. If you buy them from AliExpress and you want to, you don't mind waiting a few days, then you can get them for about 18 pounds. So let me just... Get some wick. I'm going to clean these pads away. So when I'm wicking, I want to go with the direction of the pads. I don't want to go up and down. I want to go with the direction of the pads to put a little pressure on the pads and as little strain as I possibly can. So I'll go with the direction. So these ones are sideways, so I'll go sideways with the wick. And these ones are long ways, so I'll go long ways. And just basically clear them off. Once I've actually cleaned it off, it doesn't matter which way I go. Because I'm not putting any strain on it. But I can go that way just to make sure that it cleans it fully. But while I'm actually wicking away, I don't want to put any excess strain on the pads. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's just risk mitigation more than anything. I'll clean this with IPA. How does the chip go bad? People constantly plugging them in and unplugging them, mate, mainly. Um, HDMI ports are not designed to be disconnected and reconnected all the time. And when you, when you plug them in while the console's on, if you plug it in even on a slight angle, it's going to blow the chip. That's the problem. Um, sometimes they just die just for the sake of dying. And other times they'll die because the console's overheating and the chip gets too hot. Because if you think about it, the every chip, every component has got a minimum and a maximum operating temperature. Normally, it's around about minus five degrees to um a to plus one hundred and five degrees Celsius. That's normal operating temperatures for most integrated circuits. And if you think about heat build up when you think about 
as a console gets hotter, it builds up heat inside the console. It can't vent that heat, so it gets hotter and hotter. And the heat just keeps building up and keeps building up and keeps building up. And even though the chip is not suffering with direct heat, the, the entire console is building up heat. So if you allow them to overheat for prolonged periods of time, it degrades the chip. So even though it wouldn't hit 105 degrees Celsius because the console would shut itself down before then, it does degrade over time. That's the problem. And then eventually they just fail. Um, so heat buildup is one major issue with them. A lot of the time when I have to change HDMI encoders, a lot of the time I'll find that the console is pretty dirty. This one's not that bad. I don't think that's the reason on this. I think this is down to plugging it, plugging in the console and unplugging it because the area around the HDMI port on the case uh, looked a little bit scuffed. It looked a little bit worse for wear, so I don't think heat was the issue this time, but a lot of the time it is. Or at least in my opinion, that's what I've found. Alright, so I'm going to take a brand new chip. Like I said, this is the MN86471A. I'll buy mine from AliExpress. I typically buy them in packs of 10. And yes, that is pretty expensive when, you, when you've got to pay £180 out just to buy 10 chips. Okay, um, I've got my own preferred method of of installing these chips. So some people will use hot air, but like I said, I don't like to expose this chip to heat. These are very sensitive to heat. They are really, really, really sensitive to heat. And in fact, I'm actually going to put that um, I'm actually going to put that filter back on before, or rather, I'm going to put a new filter on there before I put the chip on because, like I said, I don't like exposing them to heat, which is why I don't use hot air to actually install these chips. I'll show you the method I do use. Let me just grab a new em a new EMI filter before I do that. Yeah, I think it's when they get plugged in and out a lot. The problem is people take them around to the mate's houses to play them, and it's just no good for them. It's no good for the console. Look, people will take them around to the mate's house and have a gaming session and stuff. It doesn't end well. Right. Actually, while I'm uh, while I've got this filter off, I can actually show you inside because you can see it. if you look at the filter itself, it's just wire. It's just coils of wire. When the filter itself goes bad, it's because one of the wires will break away because of heat, or the two points will short together. Uh, but basically, it's just coils of wire. Uh, pretty much, well, it's enamelled wire, uh, so it's exactly like a normal coil. You can get away with bridging these from top to bottom. I wouldn't recommend it though. So I've got my hot air at 460. That's a little bit high, but I just haven't changed it. But basically, it's just enamelled copper wire, yeah. So I'll add a little bit of flux. And then just let surface tension take it in. Do that all the time anyway, unplugging mine. I wouldn't recommend it, mate. Mine never gets unplugged. Right, and again, these are sensitive to heat, but they are nowhere near as expensive as the chip. So I'll just test it and make sure that I've got continuity where I should have. Yeah, okay. So that's good. That's fine. Right, so with the chip, it's going to look like I'm putting this on upside down, but I'm not. So where the B25 is, that's got to be top right. Where that B25 symbol is. And you can, you can see that is indicated by this gold dot here. Now, so the way I do these, I'm going to get it lined up. To do it this way, you've got to line it up fairly perfectly. I'm going to get that lined up. And then I'm going to hold the chip in place with my finger. And so I'm going to add a little bit of flux in the corner. I'm going to move that out of the way for a sec. And what I'm going to do is 
and pop a little bit of solder onto the tip of the iron. I'm uh, basically going to tack down the corners. So tack them down. That's in place, but it's not locked in, not yet. I'm going to do the same with this corner. Tack it in. Same with this one. And the same with this one. You don't have to tack all, all eight corners down. I know I say eight, but technically it is. You don't have to tack them all down, but I do anyway. There you go. So now that's secure. So now you've got a choice. You can either hit every pin individually or you can drag solder. I like to drag solder. It's just quicker. So now I'll just add flux all around. And when I'm doing this on my own without explaining what I'm doing, it really don't take that long. Add some solder. I'm just going to add a bit there, add a bit there, add a bit there, and add a bit there. And then I'm just going to come in with the iron and just drag the solder across. Same this side. Drag it across. It helps if you've got a bevel tip for this. Bevel tips are the best for drag soldering. Drag it across. You're going to be left with some with some bridges. But we'll clean that up in a minute. Drag soldering is the best. It's so simple. There's just no skill involved in drag soldering, honestly. It's just, it's just so quick and easy. The iron does all the work. Alright, so one thing you'll find is because you've got bridges, you obviously need to clear those bridges. So one, one thing I'll do is I'll just scrape the iron across the pins. Make sure we've got enough solder on each one. And then I'll just keep cleaning my tip. Just keep cleaning my tip. And the solder will just pull itself away from the pins. And end up back on the iron. Because if you think about it, the solder loves heat. And if the solder loves heat, what's the hottest thing? It's the iron. The, hot, the iron is always going to be the hottest point. So the solder is going to want to jump back onto the iron. Well, this one, for example. Let me just make sure there's enough solder on these. Look at that. See how much just come off and went back onto the iron? What's the hottest thing? Me. <laughs> Clean the tip, do it again, and done. And that's cleaned the bridges. Beautiful. Right, let's clean this up. And that is no hot air needed. So we don't need to put any excess pressure on the chip. So we're not... Basically, we're not um, reducing the lifespan of the chip by adding heat to it. Because we, we're putting as little heat as possible on there. And it's literally for a few seconds at a time. It's not constant heat and it's not 
heat on the entire chip at once. You still, the chip's still going to get hot because you're still transferring heat to the chip, but it's not going to be anywhere near as bad as using hot air. So whenever I've got a, a QFP chip, these are called QFP chips. And uh, whenever I've got a QFP chip, I use the drag method whenever possible. Now I'm going to blast it with a little bit of warm air. It's not going to get hot. I just want to move the isopropyl alcohol out of the way. That encoder's actually just, for some reason, come off the board. That's weird. That's very weird, in fact. I've never had that happen. Well, I'll put a new one on. So I've got to replace two encoders, uh, two uh, filters, not encoder. Um, that's very strange. I've never had that happen. All right, well, I'll sort them in a minute. That's fine. But I'm going to inspect these pins, even though they look soldered. I say this every single time I do a video. Looks can be deceiving. Never trust just looks alone. Just go around each pin. Because this is going to save you having to take it back apart again. Never trust looks alone. I'm going to check that with the multimeter in a sec. I don't think there's a bridge there, but like I said, I never trust just looks. Just check your work. It's going to save you time. It might not save you time on this job, but one day it'll save you time. If it saves you time even just once, then it's worth it. But as you can see, no hot air needed, and those pins look absolutely perfect. That is drag soldering at its finest. Like I said, I can see visibly that the soldered, but I'm going to make sure. So find yourself a dead board and just practice the drag soldering method because it is probably one of the use, most useful soldering methods that you'll have. As long as you've got heat, the solder's going to follow. So as long as you hot it, as long as you've got enough flux to all that and enough heat, the solder's going to follow the iron, and that's pretty much the gist of it. Plenty of heat, plenty of flux, and you're good. Right. So just because I can see a little glimmer on pin number three and four, I'm just going to check check it quickly with continuity mode. And yeah, that's good. Okay. So no short. Oh, hang on. That's in re that's in resistance mode, not. Um, not beat mode. Yeah, still no short anyway. That's fine. Right, let me just sort this filter out. That just for some reason came off the board. I'm not sure why. It must have been weak. So it was probably heating up at some point and it's weakened the pads. It looks like the pads have actually come off, to be honest, off the actual filter itself. So I'll just clean that up. I'll just fix that up and uh, it should be good to test it. Looks burnt. It does. I think it, I think it just hit, just got too hot. Um, it wouldn't have been from this job. It would have been from the uh, from whatever damage was caused and by whatever reason. Yeah, that's actually took those pads off because I barely touched it. Yeah, it took the actual pads off the um, filter itself, which is really weird. I've never had that happen. Strange. Well, I wouldn't charge a customer extra for a filter anyway. They cost pennies. All right, solder will flow. Uh, hot air will flow. I mean, properly. It is very strange. Yeah, it's all good. Like I said, these filters cost pennies. I'm not concerned about putting a filter on. So yeah, what you can do is. You can move this out of the way, heat it up, and then just drop it down. And then we'll just flow it in properly. So that's putting as little heat as possible on that chip. Uh, on the uh, on the filter, rather. One other thing I need to do before I test it is just prep these pads here. So these pads here are going to basically allow me to solder the shield back on. So I'm going to add flux to all of these pads. 
and I'm going to replace this with leaded solder as well. Uh, pin 7, just, there's just a bit of gunk on it mate, I'll, uh, it'll clean up with IPA in a second. Or at least I think it's gunk, I hope it's not a burnt trace. Yeah, these ground pads here, I just need to tin and replace the solder. Just purely because I'm going to want to be putting the shield back on once I've tested it. So I'll just replace that with leaded solder and then I'll know that I'm going to be able to solder a new, well, sold, solder the shield back on relatively easily. Right, so let's just clean this up. Alright, so let's just dry this off and then I'll quickly inspect that pin. I do I do use a fume extractor sometimes, but I haven't got it on at the minute. I've got no room on the desk for it to be honest. Okay, so yeah, them traces are good. Let's give it a test. So I'm going to solder this back on because I'm pretty confident that it's going to work. I don't have to get perfect joints on this as long as that thing is soldered. Yep, that's good. Right, there we go. Hey Jackass, why you no work? Why you no turn on? Did I leave the 5 volt connector out? Why you not working? 5 volt connectors in. Ha! <laughs> it come out that side, you bitch! Oh, fuck face. There yeah, you know it's working. Look at that phantom power look. Aww. You did do it once. It's made me laugh before. I've unplugged I've unplugged the console, I've took it in the house and <laughs> the button's still pressing, there's that much excess power in it. Yeah, that's yeah, my my kids don't need for anything. That's that's all I care about. There we go. Now it's turning on. Alright, this is going to go to safe mode, for sure. Do for do. Do for do. We got safe mode. Where the fuck's my controller gone? There it is. Where's my cable gone? <laughs> Where's my cable gone? I don't even know. Do do, but I've lost my cable. So I've got to find the fucking there. I'm always losing my USB cable. I'm not even joking. Literally always use, losing my USB cable. I had it literally half an hour ago. I, I know I coiled it up. I coiled it up, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll keep that safe." Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. This one I'll do. <laughs> The worst thing is my mouse is going to die, and I need that specific USB cable. Nah, I didn't put it in my pocket. It's got to be that specific USB cable for my mouse. Has to be. It's the only one that fits in it. It's a weird shape. 6.72, so yeah, it is an early version. Okay, well... I pressed cancel, so that's going to turn itself off, and uh, then I'll turn it back on. So that chip was definitely dead. So that's going to go in the bin. Ah, oh, no, wrong one. No! Oh, get off it! Thank you. Right, okay, so I'm just going to do a quick couple of tests. I'll test the internet, make sure that picks up, and also test wireless controller as well. There we go. 
successful. And by the way, you can connect to the internet on these. Uh, even though this says do not update, so the guy obviously uses it for jailbreaking, you can connect to the internet on these and it won't get banned because the jailbreaks are tethered jailbreaks, which means as soon as you unplug power, then the jailbreak's gone anyway. So um, it doesn't matter if you connect to the uh, internet in them. It doesn't make any difference at all. See, this is what I did with my last cable. Look, I did exactly this. I wrapped it all up. I put it somewhere. I don't have a clue where I put it. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be it. So hopefully that helps you to diagnose these things. Um, just going through that process there. Obviously, I do things a certain way. I've got a set way of diagnosing the problem. So I'll go down each step in a step-by-step -step way. Um, because it, I just find it's quicker to do it that way. Um, I find it's quicker to do it in that particular process because a lot of the time you'll open it up and it'll be a diode or it'll be the fuse. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'll just find it quicker and easier to do it that way. It's just my own preference, but the same as the chip as well, the way I solder the chip on, that's my preference. Uh, some people like to do it different. Um, but... That's just my personal preference. I'm trying to get my disc out. It won't even shut the fucking thing down. So this definitely needs a new um, hard drive. But the issue that it came in for, obviously the uh, no display, that was down to the, um, the HDMI encoder, which I identified by the fact that the filters were suffering from crosstalk. Um, and it's usually not the filters. If it's, if it's the filter, it's usually a direct short, a zero ohm short or a two ohm short. Um, not a hundred and something ohms. So, uh, yeah, that's it. This one's done. Customer can be happy again and uh, and get paid. Yay! So I can afford to go and eat, and that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So, yeah. Uh, right, that's going to be it for tonight, guys. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate it. Hope you all had fun. I'll see you all in the next one.